Hello, today's video is about biomes. The biosphere is anywhere on Earth living things exist. It could be the water, the soil, a mountain top. Uh, as long as life is there, it's part of the biosphere. Relative to the size of the Earth, the biosphere isn't really very big, although we think of it as fairly large because it's where we live. A biome is a region within the biosphere with similar biotic and abiotic components. Biotic components are the living things, grass, trees, animals. Abiotic components are the non-living things like air, water, and soil. In this photograph of the seaside, uh, you can see examples of both biotic and abiotic components. The abiotic components would include the rock, the water, the air, soil, and the biotic components would include things like the trees on the hillside, the algae growing on the rocks, uh, the animals living in the tide pool, and the people walking around on the rocks. The same biome can exist in different parts of the world as long as the conditions are similar. For example, here's a picture of a temperate rainforest. Is this a temperate rainforest in British Columbia or New Zealand? It's pretty hard to tell. Other biomes we'll study in this course include boreal forest, desert, grassland, permanent ice, temperate deciduous forest, temperate rainforest as we've already noted, tropical rainforest, and tundra. What factors define these biomes? Biomes are classified based on many qualities such as water availability, temperature, and interactions between biotic and abiotic factors. Factors that help us identify biomes include the temperature, the amount of precipitation, the latitude, the elevation, and ocean currents. So let's take a look at a general picture of some of these biomes and you can see that there are many more biomes uh, on Earth than the ones that we're going to study but you can still make out some of the biomes that we will be studying. For example, you should be able to identify the ice sheet, okay, and you probably have noticed also the temperate rainforest region, uh, some what they're calling here temperate steppe, which we would call grassland. Uh, we see plenty of desert, and we also see lots of boreal forest, just like in Canada. You can also see some deciduous forest throughout lots of Europe and eastern Canada and the United States. We'll study these in further detail. Latitude is an important abiotic factor that influences biomes. Latitude is the distance north or south from the equator and it influences both temperature and precipitation. Uh, the tropical zone, for example, has very warm temperatures and high precipitation and that's because the sun shines straight down and the warm air holds moisture uh, better than cooler air. So if we take a look at this image, we can see the northern temperate zone and the southern temperate zone and also the tropical zone. And if we look at this little picture of the earth, we'll see what defines these areas. The main thing is sunlight. And if the sun is shining, its rays are hitting directly in the equatorial region straight down, sort of perpendicular to the actual surface of the earth. And that is very direct sunlight. Uh, rays that shine toward the northern latitudes or the southern latitudes hit the earth at more of an angle. So that's more indirect energy uh, and less energy in fact reaching the earth's surface. And so it accounts for cooler temperatures in these regions and very warm temperatures in the tropical zone. Elevation also influences biomes. Uh, the higher the elevations above sea level, the less there air there is and therefore less heat is retained. So it's much cooler on top of a mountain than it is down by the seaside. Windward sides of mountains are wet. That would be this side, kind of in the region where we live. And the leeward sides, the other side, are very dry. This would be more like the Okanagan. So if we go up a mountain, the further up a mountain we go, uh, the greater change in plant life, 
uh, we'll notice and therefore the type of animals that can actually uh, range up there as well. So what we're looking at is an image from the top of a mountain looking down and you can see trees down below but where we're standing in this image is actually above the tree line and because the conditions are cooler and there's less air up there uh, you would actually notice vegetation or plants similar to, to more northern latitudes like the tundra. Ocean currents carry warm air and moisture to coastal areas uh, where warm currents meet land temperature temperate biomes are found and that's where we live is in a temperate rainforest so here's another little image that shows you the nice warm water some people call it the Tr pineapple express because the currents that reach British Columbia actually come up from the region of Hawaii and the water's nice and warm and as it comes up to our area it basically um, helps to warm up the air around us, around it, and what you end up with is warm, moist air. And when it gets pushed up against the coastal mountains, uh, it's forced to rise. And as it rises, it cools because it's cool higher up. And because cool air can hold less moisture than warm air, that moisture comes back to us as rain, and it accounts for all the rain we get in the winter time. That cool air that's now drier continues across the mountains and when it reaches the other side it's actually so dry that it influences the climate on the other side and what you end up with is a lot of warm but dry air or dry air and in the summertime very warm air. This would be similar to what you would notice in the Okanagan. Okay, and this would be more like the coast of British Columbia. And there's our temperate rainforest again because that's what you end up with in these very uh, warm, moist areas. Climatographs. The climate is basically the average pattern of wet weather conditions over a period of several years. In this climatograph, uh, we can see uh, both temperature and precipitation. Precipitation for each month is shown in green and temperature is shown in red. So the nice thing about a climatograph is that you can look at both the temperature and the precipitation at the same time for any given month. So for example in January uh, in this region we could expect to have very little precipitation and lower temperatures. Okay. Uh, not really drastically lower. I mean this is still 20 degrees so this would probably be a region that's a fairly warm region to begin with. But as we approach the summer months, uh, June, July and August, you can actually see that there's actually a lot of precipitation. In a region like this you might call it the rainy season and the temperature is still relatively warm. And then as we uh, continue through the year to December, we start approaching the levels of precipitation that you saw in January and the temperature also begins to drop off somewhat. This type of a climatograph uh, looks like something that might, you might find in a region of perhaps uh, North America but closer to the e equator. So this could possibly be somewhere like Mexico. Uh, living things are adapted to their environments. So for example, a cactus is very well adapted to the desert. It's very good at using minimal water and still surviving. It has prickly spines to keep any opportunistic animals away so that they don't actually take its precious water. And it has very minimal leaves. In fact, that's what the spines are. So it does photosynthesis. You can see that the stalk is green, but it reduces the size of its leaves, or the size of its leaves are reduced uh, to minimize the amount of water that's lost through transpiration. A caribou is very well adapted to the tundra. Uh, it's got these great antlers for foraging, so it can uh, dig around through the the snow and gather up any food that it can find. It's got nice long legs so that it can move through the brush and it's got a fair amount of fat and uh, fairly thick fur which it can actually grow thicker in the winter time so that it can actually withstand colder temperatures. And You can see it here kind of in what looks like more of an alpine region uh, but in fact is probably uh, just the tundra. 
types of adaptations. An adaptation is a characteristic that allows an organism to better survive and reproduce. There are three types. There are structural adaptations, physiological adaptations, and behavioral adaptations. Probably the easiest one to understand is structural adaptations. It's just a physical feature that an organism has to survive. So for example, a wolf has large paws that help it to run around in the snow. It's almost like it has snowshoe feet so it doesn't sink down very easily into the snow. It's also got other structural adaptations like nice thick fur that keeps it warm when it's cold. Uh, these wonderful dog ears that allow it to triangulate and move uh, its ears around so that it can detect sounds and where the sounds are coming from it makes it a better hunter. It's also got physiological adaptations you can think of this as sort of the body chemistry of the organism. Uh, a wolf is able to maintain constant body temperature just as um, all mammals are able to do this and that's because of the type of chemistry that's going on inside of its body. Uh, it's also got many other physiological adaptations. For example, uh, the chemistry in its body might cause it to grow thicker fur uh, in the winter time. That's due to chemical reactions and production of certain proteins at a greater rate. Uh, it's got behavioral adaptations uh, because behavioral adaptations are behavior that helps an organism to survive as well. And one of the uh, behavioral adaptations is that wolves are very social animals and they work together to uh, hunt and capture their prey. It makes it possible for them to capture uh, prey that they might not otherwise be able to capture on their own.